Hey, I'm Joel Wanasek. I'm the co-founder of NailTheMix.com, the coolest place to learn how to mix your music, and I'm also a pro mixer. Today, I'm gonna teach you something that I think is insanely valuable for pretty much any artist out there. This is gonna be long, so pay attention, and I think you're really gonna get a lot of valuable information out of this. We're gonna talk about how to get your band signed today. Now, this is something that I've taken from a presentation I once did live at a URM Summit, and I've redacted it greatly, and I've kind of adapted it to fit my audience here. Without further ado, let's talk about this, and let's get into this. So, the first question you're asking, if you're not familiar with me, what the hell do you even know about this, Joel? Okay, so, we're gonna talk about how to get band signed. Now, me, myself, I've had a lot of success developing artists in my career. When I used to be a producer, I've been a mixer since 2016. But if we go way back in time, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I still live. And I got two local bands that I developed signed to very large labels, which is pretty cool. So I got one band called Mechanical Kids, which unfortunately never came out, but they got signed to Universal Motown at the time. And then a couple of years later, I got a band called Vinyl Theater signed to Fuel by Ram in Atlantic. And these were basically a bunch of kids and I trained them and I coached them and I taught them how to be successful. And we went through everything you're gonna learn here today and we built it, we pitched it, boom, we did the thing, all the information, like I said, I'm gonna teach you today. And I got those artists signed with their very, very hard work and absolutely gifted talent that they brought. So. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. So I'm gonna teach you that here. If you're also not familiar with me, I've mixed a ton of really iconic artists like Scott Stapp, Machine Head, and I've worked with so many more. You can see my entire discography if you want on mixedbyjoel.com. Okay, so that's what I know about this. I've had a lot of success with this and I've developed a lot of bands. So today I'm gonna teach you how to do it. All right, so. First off, let's get something out of the way here because I can already see the comments coming in. Ugh, record labels, this and that. I don't like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, look, I don't give a crap about any of that. I just wanna lay this out right now. Even if you don't wanna sign to a label, there's still valuable information in this. And I think it's worth your time to sit down and, you know, watch through this because like I said, I'm gonna teach you how to get signed to a label today, but I don't care what your opinion is on record labels, okay? It doesn't matter. This is information. You can use it to advance your artist's career regardless this if you want to get signed to a label or not. All right. So first question that we got to start out with is what is a record label? Because most people literally do not understand this. And um, every time I've ever asked this question to a band, I always get the wrong answer and it kind of makes me mad. <laughs> so what does a record label actually do in order for us to be successful and to build a band that's signable, right? We need to have an idea of what a record, what, what, like, what does a record label do? What are we doing? So first and foremost, record labels are investors, okay? They invest in studio time, tour support, et cetera. They give a band money. They say, your band is doing well. We're gonna take and give you a bunch of money and we're gonna make you do not well, but incredible. And then we're gonna make a bunch of money together. So they produce, sell albums, merch, and et cetera. They hope to make a profit. So picture it like this. I'm starting a band today, okay? Cool, fun, yay, right? Awesome. So. With that band, um, if I wanna get signed, I need a record label to come into an investor. I need to kind of come in with the mentality of, okay, if I'm an investor, what am I looking for in a van, in a band, not a van, a band. <laughs> what am I looking for in a band, right? Because the way a record label works is they're gonna give an artist a bunch of money and they're gonna try to get their money back through record sales, merch, tour, et cetera, all that fun stuff. And then they're gonna pay their electric bill and their staff and all the people that work for them. And then hopefully after that's done, they've made some profit and they can stay in business and find more things to invest in. Okay, so labels are investors. So like I said, we need to begin with the end in mind and learn how to think like a label. You need to train your brain to think like an investor and you need to think of an artist as a potential investment, okay? So apply that to your band right now in your head. So if you're an investor, right, how would you evaluate a company to invest in? Well, first off, how powerful is their brand? Nike, Adidas, Reebok, right? How profitable is their business or not profitable, right? Is the business growing or is it stalled out? Meaning is it doing good or is it have a lot of upward potential and things that it can grow in and is it doing you know good stuff do they have a moat meaning a protective defensive barrier around their niche or could new competitors just quickly invade that territory at any time does do they have good management right is it run by competent people who know what they're doing do you as an investor understand the business how it works 
and why it's special, right? So these are standard criteria you would invest, you know, if you're going to invest in like stocks, bonds, whatever uh, company, you would go through. Same thing we're going to apply to a band. So given that framework, here's what labels look for. Basically, they want to sign artists that already have a successful business, okay? No one wants to have something that comes out of nowhere, no one cares about, and that's just a shot at a dark. There's enough risk investing in artists to begin with. Not to mention, you know, somebody that's new uh, to the game and doesn't have anything worth investing in. So they want a band or an artist that makes some money already, that has a strong buzz, and people are talking about them, an artist that reacts. Like people hear it, they're excited to share it tell other people about it. Their branding is flawless, super important. They have a potential life cycle that will outlast a single record because who wants a band that literally has one big record and then can't write another one after that? You know, that's a lot of money to break a band and it's, you know, you want something that you can sustain and get a career out of at least 10 to 20 years. And the band is noticeably hardworking and they have a great team behind them. You know, those days of like, the 80s, right, where people could just, you know, do a ton of drugs and party a lot and just get in all kinds of trouble and trash hotel rooms and stuff like that. Nowadays, you're lowering your chance of getting invested in, you know, the market has changed a lot in the last 30, 40 years and will continue to do so. So it's important for artists to think more like business people than ever before. So if you were an investor, which one of these businesses would you most likely invest in? Okay, now you can picture bands, but we have the high market, beer, uh, wine and grocery. It looks pretty sketchy, doesn't it? Maybe a little bit unsafe, you know? And then you've got the corner deli, which looks like a really nice, well-branded place and looks very pleasant and friendly. So think about bands. Do you want a band that looks like the high market or do you want a band that looks like the corner deli? Obviously, if you're a label, you're going to invest in the corner deli band. Okay. So here's what local bands do wrong and why they stay local bands forever. And they never understand why. The first thing is they don't build a cohesive brand and they're totally ignorant of the concept. Again, it's not their fault. It's hard to find this information. And now the internet has spread some stuff out there, but unless you know like a really good producer or somebody who's high up in the industry, you're not gonna learn a lot of this stuff. It's very, very, very hard. Unless you're paying for like some really advanced course, it's gonna cost you money. But today I'm here to teach it to you for free. The second thing that local bands do that holds them back is they endlessly book a lot of poorly promoted shows. Okay, so I want you to think about it like this. If you're in the same market, right? So say Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm from, and you play every single weekend, you know, after like the sixth or seventh weekend in a row, you, you know what I mean? Anybody who's come out to see you is probably going to come out to see you unless they just happen to be a straggler who walks in that bar that day. So we've all been to the show where there's like three people and all of them are like the band's girlfriend or like, you know, the band's mom or somebody like that. And there's nobody else there other than that and the other bands. And, you know, you play the show and it sucks. I've been there myself as an artist. I understand what it's like. That's how not to do it. Third, they record a full length CD with low quality and they don't launch their product to the market correctly. This is a huge one. A lot of bands don't like this and are going to argue and get upset because they, they want to like shortcut everything. But if you're a serious band, for the love of God, you should consider working with a real producer who can actually make you sound A-level competitive. Seriously. Yeah, it costs money, but you know, um, would you rather come out and look like the corner deli, right? Or would you rather come out and look like high market, right, from the slide before? You know what I mean? Like, do you want to have something that kind of sounds like, ooh, nice demo? Or do you want to have something like, wow, this sounds great. Wow, you guys are really good. You know, like, what would you rather be? And the fourth thing that bands do is they play shows, they record small time wannabe tour forever. And then they wonder why they're not going anywhere. So they put out a crappy product. They don't build something that's marketable. You know, they basically tour and play shows that aren't promoted, that no one ever goes to. And they get stuck in this perpetual life cycle. And it goes on forever until the band breaks up or gives up. And it's kind of sad. You know, I understand because I did that for like eight years before my band finally cracked it. And then we got to go and tour and play arenas and stuff like that. So it was very interesting because for a long time, again, when I started playing music live, I want to say 1999, none of this, no one knew any of this information. And I kind of had to figure it out. And there was years and years and years of playing endless shows, doing our own self-funded tours, you know, going into markets, no one had ever heard of us. And then getting pissed when like six people would be at the bar randomly that day. And only two of them can stand around and even listen to my band. You know what I mean? Like I've been there. I sympathize and empathize with it. I understand what it's like and it sucks. So how do we break that? 
let's talk about that. Like I said, this is the formula for how to fail. It is what it is. Sorry to break it to you. But like I said, we learn from our mistakes so we can improve. So now, instead of doing things that way, there's a development process that I'm going to recommend here. And like I said, I have done this successfully many times with many artists at various levels, all the way from major labels, all the way down to smaller artists that have gotten signed to smaller indie labels. OK, so I know that this works. I did it in my own band by accident, then started doing it to other bands as a producer many years later, and it's proven. So first thing you want to do when you're starting your band and no band ever does this. I know because I've had this conversation like a million times in my life, not a million, but at least two or 300 times with different artists I've produced. No one ever does this. Literally analyze the market that you want to be in. All right. Are you a metal band? Are you a pop punk band? Are you a ska band? Are you a deathcore band? Are you, you know, trying to be a pop artist? What are you trying to be? All right. Analyze the market. Who's big? What's blowing up? What are the trends? What do people look like? What do they sound like? You know, what is going on in the market that you want to be in right now? What's hot? So look at the billboard charts, Spotify playlists, etc. You got to get a grip on what is going on. Remember, labels are investors. All right. So this is what they're putting out right now. How are we going to be competitive amongst that group of people? So number two, you want to find a market gap which you think fits you. OK, it's very, very important. So if you look at a lineup of all the top 10 bands in the genre, you're going to notice that there's differences between each one of those artists. And then the question is, where can you fit into that lineup in terms of like, what can you do that's different, that stands out, that either pushes it forward or fits in the pack because the trend is very, very popular. So the next thing you're going to do once you've identified that position and that alone can take you a week or two weeks of just hardcore research. But once you find something that is new that you can bring that's going to get attention, right? You're going to number three, build your brand to fill this gap. Super huge. Okay. Normally I would sit down with a band as a producer and I'd be leading the charge. The band would walk in. I'd be like, okay, you're an alt rock band. Let's, um, here's what's going on in alt rock right now. Here's what happened in the past. Here's what we see people doing on radio. I'm going to go talk to some of my writer friends in LA and Nashville, see what people are doing and trying to do and what they think is the next thing. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, we're going to go this direction. This is what we can do. This is different. And this fits who you are. And it's cohesive with your, you know, natural instinct as a band and your sound. You know, we're going to build something amazing and unique. OK, so try to anticipate six to 12 months ahead of where the genre is right now and where it's going to be. Like I said, you don't want to be what's hot now because the stuff you hear on the radio or whatever is already a couple months old. You want to be on the edge of what's about to be hot or you want to become what is going to be hot. It's hard to do, but people do it all the time. Once we've built a product that fits into that we're going to know going to do number four, which is we're going to take the product to market and we are going to see how the market reacts. Now, this is the thing that drives me nuts about music. All right. So when we run an ad at Nail the Mix, right, we don't sit down and we're like, all right, we have an ad. Let's go throw a bunch of money behind it. We sit down. We don't guess. We test. OK, we sit down and we say, all right, we're going to run a bunch of different ad sets. We're going to test them out real quick, optimize them over a couple of days, and we're going to pick the winner. Once we have the winner, that's what you throw your money before uh, behind. And that's how every successful company in the world advertises. You know, they literally sit down and they're like, all right, let's go test a bunch of headlines. OK, let's go test a bunch of, um, you know, ad copy. Let's test some different videos and stuff. And all of a sudden we see, hey, we've done 20 ads. We've thrown five dollars between each of them on Facebook advertising. Ad number six gets a higher click through rate by 10% more than any other ad that we're running. So why would you put money behind ad number one or two or three? You see? So the problem is, is that in music people get, I get it. It's art, right? I, I totally understand. Like people get precious about it. They're like, this is my art. And it's like, they put it out and if it doesn't immediately react and no one else likes it, then, you know, it's, you know, anything can happen. You know, people, there's a whole number of reasons of, you know, people get mad about it. Okay. So what I'm saying is try a different approach and a different approach is put it out, see how people react to it. And if they don't react, okay, you either need to retool the brand and start over, or you need to double down, right? You need to double down if it's working and you know, you hit something. Okay. Super, super important. You know, it's, it's like figure out where it's going to go, make a project around it, release the project. And if the project doesn't hit, and if it doesn't resonate and it doesn't react, 
don't push it. You need to either retool it or you need to restart it. Okay. Again, this is for people that want to get signed. Okay. This is not for the, you, I, I know every artsy argument somebody's going to say in the comment section, well, that's not fair. I don't want to do this, blah, 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 blah. Like I, like I said, I don't care about any of that. This is for people that want to get signed. This is how it works. This is what you need to do. If, if this is your goal, follow the formula. It works. Okay. <laughs> Next, we need to talk about how to launch properly. So Eternal local bands, they don't have a plan. They have no idea what they're actually doing, right? They just haphazardly do everything, all right? Talked about that, I feel like, enough. But potential national bands, bands that are going to be big, what they do is they build a package, right? A well-calculated package. They launch it to the world seemingly out of nowhere. They get feedback and they adjust. They build momentum if it reacts and they double down and then, you know, because they know they got something. So in order to do that, simple formula. Let's back up and talk about branding because branding is like the, the most important part of this and something as a producer, I would always spend the most time and something that, and again, in my experience, bands spend the least time thinking about. Usually a band is like, hey, you play guitar, I play bass, my buddy plays drums and you know, my other buddy can sing. So like, let's get together and jam on Saturday. Great. Like I said, if we're trying to get signed, we need to be a little bit more tactical and a little bit more calculated than that. We need to say, hey, we need to build a successful brand. Once we've done that, we are investable. So every business has a brand. So why shouldn't an artist be one? Every artist is a brand that's successful. So think about this. Walmart versus Amazon. What's the difference? Apple versus Microsoft. Whole Foods versus any conventional grocery store. Lamborghini versus Kia. Katy Perry versus Metallica. When you think of these brands, a very clear picture comes into your mind of who they are and what they actually do, okay? So when I say Nickelback, you think of something. You know, when I say Dua Lipa, you think of something. You know, when I say Cannibal Corpse, you think of something. When I say Children of Bodom, you think of something. When I say Cardi B, you think of something. You know, when I say Migos, like all of these artists, bands, have a brand that is super well thought out, super established, and people react to it, okay? That's what we're trying to do here. From now on, you're gonna think of artists equal brands, all right? Every artist is a brand. A successful brand is a unique one, okay? We call this positioning in Mark, all right? Which people identify with. For example, what will a fan put on their t-shirt that says to the world that like, this is who I am, all right? So think about like high school, you know? I grew up in the in the 90s. I went to high school and like, you know, there'd be like the person with like the Marilyn Manson shirt and the all black and the eyeliner and the, they'd walk around like angry and depressed. You know, those were the lifestyle kids, you know, the gothic kids, right? And then you had like the metal heads wearing the obituary and the dying fetus and the cannibal corpse t-shirt. And then you had like the jocks, you know, and they'd be like wearing their like, um, you know, uh, what band was big? Bush, <laughs> right? <laughs> they'd be jamming something like that, you know, or yeah, then you'd have like the stoners who would have like the fish shirt on, you know what I mean? Like what is your band? You think about it like this, you know, it's like wrestling. You got to wrap it around your shirt and wear it pr like proud at high school. Who are you? This is my identity. We are trying to build something here. Or I should say you are, you're trying to build something here for your band, your art, you know, your artist career that somebody's going to put on their t-shirt that says, this is who I am. Look at me so they can wear it. This is why concert t-shirts are cool, you know, because people want to wear it. They want to wear that cannibal corpse shirt to school and be like, yeah, I'm a badass. I listen to cannibal corpse, you posers. You know what I mean? Like you need a cool brand. So from now on, you need to think about artists being brands. You as an artist, you're a brand. If you're a producer watching this, all of your artists are now brands and you need to evaluate their potential based off their brand value. Okay. Let's talk about positioning. Demographics determine an artist's position. So the question is, who is the artist's target market? So for example, what's the target market? Like, for example, like edge, edge lord lifestyle teens from broken homes or blue collar or middle America or hood life, you know, or like 18 to 28 year old hipsters or grandmas and grandpas or kids, you know, you have children's music, right? Every one of these groups, and there's so many different demographics out there are a different demographic, you know, you got boomers, you got Gen Z, Gen Y, you know, millennials, whatever. Every one of these is a different demographic. They have different values, different things. So you got to pick a demographic that you want to appeal to. You know, it's like an emo band doesn't appeal to my mom. Who's like in her sixties, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, or fifties or whatever. I, I, I've lost count uh, 60. Yeah. I'm going to get killed for that. That just doesn't apply. Just like I have a hard time listening to sixties music because I'm 40, you know, I'm over, I'm 42 years old. So like it was before my time. So demographics. So pick one, right? Here's a great example of branding that I think was amazing. So let's roll it back about 
you know, a decade as it's 2023. Let's talk about 2012, if you remember this. This is a really good comparison. In 2012, we had three female pop stars that just dominated all of the radio and they were all branded incredibly well. So we had Katy Perry, we had Kesha, we had Lady Gaga. Now, if you take Katy Perry, Katy Perry was like the girl next door. You know, she was like the 50s throwback pinup kind of girl. You know what I mean? That was her brand. Very relatable. Then you had Kesha. Kesha was the party girl. You know what I mean? Like all of Kesha's songs, her sound, everything, you know, if you've never heard any of these artists, go listen to their music from that time period. And you'll hear the differences sonically and, and you can watch the videos in the image. Kesha was the party girl. And then you had Lady Gaga, who was just like the really crazy out there, strange, super indie. So, you know, all three of these brands, totally, totally unique. All three of them resonated and all three of these artists were totally huge and absolutely dominated the music. So this is a perfect example of positioning. Now, if you had another artist, if we were looking at this, right, and we were trying to position a female front person to become a pop star in 2012, I'd be looking at Katy Perry, Kesha, and Lady Gaga. I'd be like, all right, so we've got a pinup, we've got a party girl, and we've got like the strange and eccentric. Where are we going to fit? What can we possibly do that's different that doesn't touch one of those three bases, but gives you a fourth option? That's what I'd be doing as a producer. So as an artist, that's what you should be doing and how you should be thinking. So brands must be cohesive to resonate, okay? Everything you do is your brand, right? The artist's name and the logo. Does the logo and the name reflect how they sound? You know, the name Cannibal Corpse, okay? Well, obviously, that to me sounds like a death metal band. Now, if I heard Cannibal Corpse and they played like soft children's music, I'd be like, what the hell? You know what I mean? <laughs> like you'd sit there and you'd watch that and you'd just be like, it's hard to blow something up like that. It doesn't make sense to the brain. It's it's like, you know, it's like a, a movie that doesn't end with a happy ending, just leaves you on a cliffhanger. You just ends and you're like, wait, what? It, it's like really unsettling. So, you know, the logo, the name, the sound, they have to be cohesive. You know what I mean? Like you can't have a name and a logo and all that stuff that looks death metal and then be a pop artist. I mean, you could, but. I don't know. So next is the image. The band must look like a band in the genre. Like this is an absolute thing. You have to have a great image as a band, period. Like you have to look like you're in a band. I didn't understand this for a long time because I, when I was younger, you know, like we didn't look like metal bands. And then like, you know, we would go talk to managers and be like, yeah, your music's really good, but uh, you got to work on your image and, you know, you probably need a better vocalist. And we were like, oh no, man, that's bullshit. Like mega ass vocal, you know, like, or you know, we'd start citing bands and they would just be like, get lost. You know what I mean? Like we didn't get it. Every argument we would use why, you know, when somebody would give us this feedback, we should have just listened and um, hey, you know, you learn. So I learned that lesson a long time ago. You got to look like what you're trying to do. So if I was on a metal band back then, you know, should have grown my hair out, maybe got some tattoos and, you know, some camel pants or something like that, you know, but I mean, this was, well, I'm talking like 2005 <laughs> when I was in a band. <laughs> going through that. Okay. So next is the songs, right? Does the music sound and look like the artist? You know, like I said, if you listen to like Nickelback, right. And you see, you see a bunch of like blue collar looking guys and you listen to it and it's like some really artsy indie stuff. You're going to be confused. You know what I mean? It just doesn't, that, that's not what you expect to hear. Next is online presence. Okay. Does the group look professional online and come as, you know, come across as already signed and big. And this is something that drives me nuts. Like if you go and you look at like the Facebook, the TikTok, the Instagram of like a big artist, and then go look at a small artist that's just starting, like you can see the difference right away. This is a great homework experiment. We'll talk about this a little bit later. And five is positioning. Does the artist brand cohesively fit into the market? Like I said, you got to look at like what's cool right now. What are people doing? And is what we're trying to do, does that fit into the market? Are you adding something new that people are going to grab onto that they're going to hear? You know, because people give you 10 seconds to evaluate you. They're going to hear it. It's going to catch their attention. It's going to hold their attention. They're going to get excited about it, resonate, and then go show that to somebody else and be like, I discovered this new band. You have to hear this. This is amazing. That's what it's all about. Okay, so the ultimate goal here of what we're trying to do is you want to build the perfect package, okay? You want to make a brand, a band, a brand, right? <laughs> so undeniable that people can't help but get excited about it and just all they want to do is share it, tell people about it, 
Y you know what I mean? Like that's when a band blows up. So starting off with the name and logo. First thing is the consideration. Does the name roll off the tongue and sound cool? Like if your name and logo don't sound cool, no one cares. All right. You know, like good names, Metallica, Rush, Migos, Rob Zombie, Lil Pump, Architects. Those are great names. They roll off the tongue. They sound like bands, right? If somebody came up to me and was like, hey, I've got a new band and, you know, they would be like, we're going to be called like the disposable new New York uh, sewer cleaners. And I'd be like, that name sucks. The next one is, does their name sound like their music? Now I'm going to pick on my good friends in the band Vinyl Theater, but when that band came to me and I started developing them and working with them, they sounded like a metalcore band. Their name was Before the War and they walked in and they're like, okay, book Before the War. It sounds like another metalcore band because this is like 2000 and say 11 or 12 or something when I started working with them and like that stuff was super popular and they come in and they're playing this like alt indie rock stuff and I'm like, how come you guys got a metal band name? And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? So we need to change that. If you want to get signed, we got to get a name that sounds a little bit more like what you're doing. So, you know, there, there's a classic example of like the band had a metal band name and they came in, but they were not a metal band. And it was like, we kind of definitely had to change the metal band name to something that wasn't metal band sounding because they weren't a metal band. Right? So it needs to sound like that. Next is, does it look cool on a t-shirt or on the album artwork? I mean, I can't tell you how many times, maybe I'm showing my age, but when I was a kid, like you would go to the record store and you'd see like a sick t-shirt or a sick looking CD and you would buy it because the album art was badass or the t-shirt was badass. And like, you didn't even, you didn't even know what it was, but you saw a shirt that said dope. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to wear that at school. That's going to get me in a lot of trouble. My parents are going to be pissed and it's going to be sick. So you know what I mean? Like you need something that looks cool, that resonates. And, you know, major corporations put a ton of money into their logo designs. You know, like the Nike swoosh, you know, or like Apple's little logo, or, you know, a lot of thought goes into this stuff. Same thing with big bands. A lot of thought goes into the logo and how that's presented. Because again, you need a sick shirt where you're at the hot topic or the zoomies or whatever, you know, and you walk in and you're ready to tear it up when you're like 14 and you see that shirt and you're like, oh, hell yeah. I never even heard of this band, but I am so going to wear this to school tomorrow and it's going to be awesome. And I might as well get the CD and listen to that anyways, you know, while I'm at it. And you know what I mean? Like that, that's how this goes down. So don't be afraid to invest some money into getting a great logo. Noticing a theme here, you know, like if you're running stuff like a business, you have to invest money in it. I hate to say it. I know people get upset by that. They think that you should be able to do everything for free, but that's not how the world works, unfortunately. So here's a good guideline for a logo. Can you scratch it onto a school desk or the grip tape of a skateboard, you know, like Slayer, Kiss, you know, these are good logos. Like you look at this, it's very identifiable. You know what you're looking at. Now, how to make a forgettable logo. Now, don't beat me up. I love black metal and death metal. And like the first band that I think did this sort of thing was really, really smart. But the fact is now all of these bands, like I can't read any of this. I mean, some of, oh, it, it's really rough. So, you know, I mean, at least the logo looks like the music when you look at this. But the problem is, is like, like I said, when you see it like this, and not to pick on the metal bands, I love you all. And I'm a metal head at heart, but um, not the best logo design, in my opinion, you know, because it's like, if we wear like this one and this one and this one to school, like, you know, anybody who doesn't know what these three, and again, maybe that's the point, but anybody who doesn't know what those three bands are is going to be like, what are you, what is that on your shirt? You know, did you spill something on it? <laughs> Next up is image. Does the band look like a band? This is so important. Like I said, you know, you got to lock this down. So your wardrobe should be really, 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 really well thought out. Okay. All the way to each individual member. So haircuts, color of hair, you know, I'll give you an example, something iconic, Haley Williams, Paramore, orange hair. No one had orange hair anywhere. It was unheard of. Comes out. She has orange hair, instantly identifiable, brilliant move, totally iconic. Awesome. A simple hair color. Very, very well branded and very well thought out. Next, makeup. You know what I mean? There was times that bands would wear eyeliner. Then there was times that bands wouldn't. And then there was times that bands would do corpse paint. And you know what I mean? All of that stuff is deliberate. Next, um, shirts, dresses, pants, shoes, you know? So like, you know, if you're in a metal band and you're not wearing like steel toe combat boots and you sound like Slayer, but you show up like wearing like office attire and a suit or something like that, you know what I mean? Like it's probably going to confuse people. Even your shoes matter when you're doing band photos. Accessories are important. Should you have tattoos? Uh, your posture and your stance in pictures. This is pretty obvious. You know, like, how do you tell a metal band right away? 
bunch of long haired dudes sitting there looking pissed with their arms crossed. Like, yeah, you know, we're, we're angry. <laughs> now imagine like, uh, you know, a bunch of people dressed in nice suits, looking very nice, like a corporate, a bunch of lawyers, you know, sitting there with a smile and a picture. And then like, you know, it's like a grindcore band. You'd be kind of like confused. I mean, actually that might kind of be badass given the genre, but you see what I'm saying? Like, you know, the way people stand and the way people posture themselves in pictures is important. So bottom line, you got to keep up with the trends and you got to lead them. You know what I mean? Like you got to look at what other people are doing that are big in the genre and do something a little bit different to push it. How over the top you want to go, that's up to you. But again, these are just ideas for you to think about because if you can solve this puzzle and you do it right, you'll build something that reacts. And if you build something that reacts, your life will change, period. Okay, next. Here's a good example of a band that is completely transformed. Now, this is going back in time, but we got the Devil Wears Prada. We got the super emo look here up on top. And then look down. We've grown up and we've become hipsters. <laughs> so you can see that, um, you know, bands go through evolutions. They're always working on their imaging and the branding and it's changing as, you know, the years go on and as styles and the trends change. So again, it's important to consider. You want to look like a big band, not a small band. Next, very, very crucial is the individual members of your band must be branded. All of the best brands have strong individual member brands as well, okay? So Pantera, Dime, Vinny, Phil, Rex, right? All Iconic, Metallica, James, Lars, Kirk, Cliff, Motley Crue, Vince, Tommy, you know, Mick, Nikki, Led Zeppelin, Paige, Plant, Bonham. Like, if you can think of a big band, right, you probably know quite a few people in that band. They have you know, iconic images. Again, let, let's go back to Haley Williams because so well branded, you know, like what an iconic branding, you know, Haley had like just orange hair and like no one was doing it. And like, it, it was just like totally came out of nowhere. No one was doing anything, just inspired an entire trend. So, you know what I mean? That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build something iconic. Now the rest of the band doesn't have orange hair, just the front woman, right? <laughs> you know, all of that stuff is calculated. Producers sit down with artists, management teams sit down with artists, and we sit down and we think about this stuff. We build this stuff and we try to build things that are going to resonate, like I said, that are in tune with the natural talents and the types of songs that somebody wants to write. You know what I mean? Like we try to take an artist who's got talent and build something around them to amplify that person's charisma and personality. That's what you need to do. Next, the front man or woman is the most important person in the group, period. Okay, get this in your heads. If you don't have a front person that has the it factor, your chances of getting that artist's, uh, you know, huge are seriously diminished. The it factor is just like, how do I explain it? You go to a concert and you just watch a, a show and some bands like the front person just gets up there and has such a captivating charisma. You're, you're just like, okay, Jacoby Shaddix, Papa Roach. Like you go see Papa Roach and you've never caught a Roach show. Like Jacoby hits the stage with such energy and passion. You're just like the whole time you're like, wow. This slams like you, you can't deny how sick his stage presence and charisma is like that's a front man who has the imp factor, you know, like that's it. So the question you need to ask yourself if you're building a band is does the front person is the kind of person that's going to be embraced by the current generation as a symbol of that generation? Like I said, we're going to plaster that person's face on a t-shirt that somebody else is going to use to identify with at school or, you know, at the mall or, you know, in their workplace or at the concert or, you know, when they go LARPing on the weekend with their friends or play D&D. &D, you know what I mean? Like, what does that look like? You got to answer that question. The front person needs to have an insane amount of charisma and charisma can, it can be something that's like super weird and like super mysterious and like kind of, you know, like, um, you know, or, or it can be like completely over the top. For example, take sleep token versus Jacoby Shaddix of Papa Roach versus something like maybe Sunno. you know what I mean? Like total opposites in terms of the type of stage performance and show or ghost, right? All of those different brands and front people have like different approaches and different types of charisma. So you can be like the weird person who stands there and doesn't say anything with their back to the show and plays drones on guitar. Or you can be the person that's jumping up and all hyped and getting everybody going. Like every single great front person has charisma and there's different kinds of it. So this person also, and this is super important, I cannot emphasize this enough for my vocalists out there, you're all going to hate me, but this person needs to have an identifiable voice preferably an iconic lead voice. Okay. So if you're like not a great singer, 
you can still be in a band that blows up. If you have a voice that's identifiable, like you like you hear Cardi B on the radio, you know it's Cardi B. No one else sounds like Cardi B. You know, you hear Chad Kroger from Nickelback, no one else sounds like Chad, okay? You know, you hear James Hetfield from Metallica, no one else sounds like James Hetfield from Metallica. You know what I mean? Dave Mustaine, no one else sounds like Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. You know what I mean? Like all of these people are iconic front people and they have a signature sound and an identifiable voice that if you're listening to the radio, you could be like, oh, that's the Rolling Stones. Oh, that's Aerosmith. Oh, that's Madonna, right? Now let's talk about the songs. This is something everybody gets precious about because everybody just like everybody thinks they can sing. I've watched American Idol. Everybody thinks their songs are great, but not everybody's songs, unfortunately, are great. I'm sorry to tell you. It's okay. Let's keep writing more. You'll get better at it, right? Just like not every song I've ever mixed is good. You know, I've had to mix for over 20 years and probably put down somewhere between five to 10,000 songs I've had to mix before I've started getting good at it and getting songs on the radio regularly. And like, you know what I mean? It, it, it's a process. So great songs are, of course, a requirement. Some specifics to consider. First off, what are the trends in the genre? What's coming in? What's going out? Next, is the genre growing, shrinking, or flat? All right, so you obviously wanna be in a genre that's growing, but more than anything, the artist needs a hit, okay? You have to have a hit. Like if you wanna get signed, you need a hit, period. Don't argue, you're wrong. You need a hit, you have to have a hit. And yes, even metal, y'all fight you on this, has hits. Raining Blood, Walk, Inner Sandman, Crazy Trade, Nookie, Halo, yes, my friends who play obscure, weird ass, artsy music. Even you can be signable, and yes, even you can write a hit for your demographic. Few sizable labels want to invest in bands that have like super weird artsy songs and don't have hooks, okay? So the fastest way to do this, and a lot of people get mad about this because like I said, everybody thinks they can write a hit, but only a few people actually can. Just like everybody thinks they can be a pro basketball player, but at the end of the day, there's only a couple of Michael Jordans out there. Smart artists hire songwriters. Because at the end of the day, imagine walking into the studio with the Michael Jordan or LeBron James of songwriting you know, and sitting down and trying to write three songs to pitch as your brand new artist. And you come up with all this branding and stuff. And then you write those songs. You think you're going to get a much higher success ratio than doing it on your own. Most likely can't guarantee it because artist objective, but I can say that a lot of people go and co-write with producers when they're starting bands that usually become successful. It's something that's highly recommended to invest in. You can write all your own songs, bring stuff in and go work with a producer. They'll help you co-write. They will help you massage and take that stuff up to another level, at least in terms of the label size. And again, our goal here is to get signed. Our goal not here is not to make some like weird indie music that nobody cares about. Again, I respect all of it. But like I said, the whole point of this lecture here is to teach you how to get signed and to teach you what the people that are going to be signing you are going to care about. So please understand how important it is to write good songs. And if you write and do co-writing with legitimate co-writers, that is a major plus on your rep sheet to walk into a label like, yeah, you know, here's our numbers. Here's what we've done. Here's our song. We think it can go number one. All right. Hits play. Wow. This song's a banger. Yeah. We co-wrote it with this person. Oh, that person writes a lot of hits and we did it with this producer. We had this person mix it and this person master it. They'll be like, oh, wow. This band really has their shit together and is really, really, really serious. Okay. So. For my metal friends out here or my obscure indie friends and people that are like, oh man, not everything has a hit. That's bullshit. Here we go. Even Cannibal Corpse can write a hit. Hammer Smash Face. There's a hit. Log on to Spotify. Look at your favorite artists. Find the song that they've blown up on. Boom. There, my friends, is the hit. Every big band has a hit in their genre. I don't care how obscure or how mainstream it is. You can have a hit. A hit is a song that simply reacts with a massive group of people in the demographic that your band is positioned in. Okay? We agree on that at least. A great producer once told me this, and this is going to be controversial and I'm going to get the crap kicked out of me for this, but be gentle. One thing I've seen is like people want to come in and get all artsy and like pretentious about their songs. And then they're like, well, I want to get signed. And I'm like, well, hold on. What we have here is not signable yet. And they're like, oh no, you just don't understand it. And I'm like, okay, let's take it to market and test it because right now we just have opinions in the room. And then we test it. And then what happens is, hey, it doesn't go so well. So a lot of people don't understand if the goal is to get signed and you want to be a successful artist and you, and you want to be like this weird indie artist, but you want to have massive commercial success, you need to write the hit record first, meaning get rich, then ruin your career with a crappy record that all your fans are going to hate. Get artists, you know, get artsy after you've made the hit record. You need the hit record so you have the money 
to live off of while you write a record that isn't any good. So I recommend to anybody who wants to be successful, get signed and try to do well in this industry to necessarily come out and try to write something that's successful, make your money. And then if you want to go off and do some weird ass side project, hey, you're not going to have to worry about, are you going to eat next week? Are you going to pay your rent? Just something to take into consideration. I don't even know why that's debatable, but man, people go crazy over that kind of stuff. All right. Next is online presence. And this is super, super, super important, especially in the age where you can just like blow up a band on TikTok. Or I remember when you could just blow up on MySpace or there was even a period in Facebook where you could just blow up and annihilate. So this is one of the main things the industry is going to look at. Um, engagement is more important than follower count. So many people buy followers. They're like, oh, I've got a million followers. And you go look and they got like eight likes in their comments. And you're like, what? Oh, you bought them. Like people at labels are pretty sharp. You know what I mean? And marketing managers and social media managers, like they're going to look at this and they're going to analyze it on a mathematical level. They want to see, like, give me your Spotify data. You know, let's see the engagement. You ran this campaign during this period. Okay, I want to see the data. You know, I'll give you an example. I have a really, really great indie band called Versus Me. I remember once they had a song just blow up on TikTok. The singer called me because we're good friends and I, I'm heavily involved in like, you know, we, we work together. We always talk about like marketing and ways we can build the, the band up. We're looking at like the TikTok and the Spotify data as that video went up and like versus their radio campaign. You see how, you know, we're handling things empirically. We're like looking at it. We're like, wow, we had this TikTok and it blew up and then look at all this boost in Spotify and then we get added to this and this and this playlist and this and that happened and it was really, really awesome. And then this was the result in sales and we're like, wow. And then we did the radio campaign and we invested over here and this and this happened and this, you know what I mean? You see how that works? How many local bands think about stuff like that? Hopefully after this, if you've stuck around this far, you will. All right. That's the goal here. I'm trying to help you. So buying followers makes you look small time and, and foolish. Social media is practically a full-time job, but it's very important. So don't let, you know, like don't do it. Okay. Like I can't even tell you what I would recommend. Okay. If you want to be in a serious band is have a band practice, maybe like twice a week and then pick one person who's good at this stuff. And all they do every day for an hour a day is just make TikToks, Instagrams, Facebooks, whatever, social media assets, and they just deliver content day after day after day after day. Have somebody focus on that. Have somebody focus, maybe who's the strongest writer in the band, you know, focus on writing songs. Have somebody focus on, you know what I mean? Like you need to focus on what people are strong at in the band so they can do that. So not enough people focus on this stuff. You really got to blow up the social media, the numbers. They want to see that. That's a great way to see if it's resonating or not. The artists should look, act, and engage like they're already big in a sign band. I can't tell you how many times, here we go, all my producer friends are going to laugh. Big things coming soon. And it's like the band has eight followers. And it's like, hold on, big things coming? Like if Limp Bizkit came out and said, hey, we're going on tour or, you know, and we've been on hiatus, you know, that's a big thing that's coming soon. We know that's going to be sold out and there's going to be a lot of media about it. But like when the band on the street who is like never released a demo and has eight followers comes out and says like big things coming soon, not the best strategy. So don't look like a local band online. Look at what big bands do, act like that, engage with people, have real conversations, build up a real fan base. But marketing is a whole nother lecture and, you know, maybe we'll talk about that some other time. Okay, so... An exercise um, for you is to go through and compare local versus national bands. I cannot recommend this enough. Okay, I feel like every producer should do this, but every person in a band should do this because like, honestly, you know, sitting down and looking at like what a big band looks like and then looking at like what whatever your stuff looks like, it can be a hard sobering reality. So for example, here's a Katy Perry thing I pulled back in the day when I was originally going through this and presenting this lecture live. Just look at how awesome this page looks. Like this is so well branded, like the colors, the eye, you know, every single thing on this is just very, very intelligently thought out. You know what I mean? This is branded down to a T, like the whole image, everything is calculated. You can tell a team of people sat down and came up with this. If your Instagram or, you know, your, your Facebook doesn't look as good as this, you're not trying hard enough. You need to work harder on it. Now that we've established all of that, all right, we're getting close to the end. So again, hopefully you've stuck with me and not glossed this, but if you're serious and you've stuck with me through this, you have a much higher chance of succeeding than somebody who peaced out at like six minutes. So how to create momentum for a new band. So first thing we're going to do, we identify an undeniable brand or create an, unde an undeniable brand. I can't speak English anymore. We're going to make an amazing three song EP with three potential genre relevant hits, at least three songs that we think could be hits. All right. So if you don't have three songs that you're going to be hits, you write more. Like I can't tell you how many times like an artist will go and they'll write with 30 different 
co-writers, right? They'll come up with a hundred songs. They will walk into a producer and a label meeting and they will pick 12. They will go then do the record. Out of those 12, maybe three they think are going to be hits. And that's what they're going to go put their money behind. See what I mean? So you got to do the same thing, right? Go write a hundred songs. Maybe some of them you co-write, some of them you write yourself, whatever, but go write a hundred songs. Pick three, three best ones. Go show them to your friends, see what they react to. You know what I mean? And you, you get unbiased feedback, by the way. It's a good tip. If you go up and you don't be like, well, what do you think of this? Of course, they're going to be like, oh, it's great because they're your friend. But be like, hey, I've got a couple of songs. Can you listen to them? Tell me which one you think is the best. And you'll get a more honest answer. Next, I recommend making an undeniably awesome video for these songs. Super, super important. You know, you want the image for, you know, the look for it. Uh, you're going to release it to the public and you're going to see if it catches. You, you know, like don't drip it. Come out of nowhere and launch the package. Now, I personally like dropping it and then like coming out with a single like every 45 to 60 days because like a hype cycle, it's kind of like a, a curve, you know, it's like it builds up, builds up, builds up. People start losing attention, but then you have another thing that's building up and hopefully it is an upward trajectory. You can get the curves to stack on each other and go up and up and up and up as opposed to just coming up, dying down, you know, like putting out an album or a three song EP. People are excited and they're not excited anymore. They forget in two weeks, right? So in or three or four weeks when people start forgetting, we start introducing something new and that's exciting. And hopefully we can peak some more interest and grow and grow and grow. So I like to do it that way. Um, and I, I think I've changed from how I would have done it maybe like 10 years ago, but you know, in 2023, that's definitely my opinion in the way, um, you got to work social media. Like it's a full-time job. You got to prove that you can draw. So I recommend not playing a ton of shows, but playing a few calculated regional shows that are insanely well promoted. I'll use a, the band Vinyl Theater, for example. I mean, I think before they even played a show, we had gotten them a manager and we were able to get on a couple of decent shows and we were able to promote them. So when the band got on stage for the first time, they were in front of a couple hundred people as opposed to playing for six people at the bar. Uh, you know, that don't care that we're already there drinking anyways. And you're just there in the background as the band. You see the difference. So you got to get this stuff calculated. You want to obviously hustle merch like crazy and develop numbers. Cause if you play your first show and you can maybe like buy onto something or your manager can get you something, whatever, like if you can get in front of a lot of people and then you can go clean out and be like, look, we moved two grand in merch tonight. Like you can do that at a local show. If you hustle, I've seen it done. Okay. But if you can clean house and kick ass and convert people, that's something you can walk into to a record label and be like, look, we've played four shows at these shows. We've sold out all of our stuff every single time. We've done this. We've done that. And they'll be like, wow, this band is reacting. See, if there's serious hype pitch to a manager who will then pitch the artist to the label. No, walk into the label. Always walk into the manager. The manager will pick you, uh, get you to a label. How do you find a manager? Well, go look at some bands that are in your genre that have managers and <laughs> Go, I don't want to say punish them. I don't recommend doing that. That's a good way to piss people off. But a lot of people will listen and give you a chance because certain managers are always looking for new talent and new baby bands to develop, okay? Because every manager knows if they hit the next band, they are going to be filthy rich. So it's a very, very, very common thing. So if the market doesn't react, just evaluate the brand and retool. So like I said, maybe you've done a couple of singles. Maybe you've tried playing a couple of shows. They didn't go so well. People were checked out. People weren't really digging it. You didn't sell a lot of merch. Okay, well, something's off with your brand. You got to try something else. It's, you got to be honest, you know? So you repeat until you flop or you blow up. All right, it's a formula. Now we're talking about how to pitch to a manager or a label. So the best case scenario, your band makes a splash locally. And believe me, if they do, and you do, um, the industry will come to you. But if you can't and you need to actively pitch, here's a couple of tips. First is um, you want to build rapport with the manager before you pitch them. You know what I mean? You, you want to like, you don't want to just like, hey, check out my band, bro. You know what I mean? Like talk to people like they're people. You know, you need a better pitch than that. So rather than explicitly pitching, just ask for an opinion in case they think it sucks. You have an easy out. So one thing I recommend is, you know, to consider going, like I said, and doing co-writing with teams and doing co-writes, because when you walk into a manager, and now picture, picture the scenario, um, it's going to add credibility. Like picture the scenario where it's like, Hey, um, I'm Steve. I play in a band called the Nookie and we, um, <laughs> we just did our first EP. We self did everything and, you know, we did our own video and we're going to be the next big thing. And the managers be like, okay, yeah, right to the, right to the bin. Now imagine, hi, my name is Tom. I play in, 
you know, this band, you've got a catchy name. You know, we just wrote songs with this and this and this person. We did, a, we did three songs with this and this and that producer. We had this person mix it, you know, uh, we're ready to go. We're looking to shop around and get a label. Like instantly the manager's going to be like, check, 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 check. Okay, cool. This person's worth my time. They're serious. They've worked with somebody I've heard of. This is exciting. So, you know, that will can add credibility to your story. That helps much better than a cold pitch. Cause again, if somebody hits me up as a mixer and says, Hey, you know, I've worked with this person, you know, I've got this song. I want to take it to radio. Please make my song sound great. I've worked with that producer. I'm like, hell yeah. Somebody hits me up. They're like, well, you know, um, this is my first EP. I kind of did this myself. I've never recorded anything before. Can you mix this? I'm going to be like, okay, you know, um, let me listen to it first to make sure it's something I want to put my name on it and make sure that I can, you know, it's good enough to be mixed and it's going to be worth your time and money. You know, when you approach people, you have to have something to offer them. If the band can find private investors, that always helps. Some bands are privately invested, you know, like they get that oil money or something like that. Or, you know, somebody, you know, they got a friend who's like sold some company and he's just got hundreds of millions of dollars sitting around and they're bored. And, you know, they, they, they're they just, you know, they want to give some money to you because they like you and they care and they want to help you out. And, you know, that stuff happens all the time where people bring in private investors. Labels love that. Managers love that because it eases the financial risk on their side. And... This is important. This goes back to doing the co-writes. But if you're a badass, right, and your band is sick, your producer will make calls on your behalf. I hesitantly do this for artists I work with, but when I was a producer, if I had something that I believed in that we was really sick, I'd show this to my manager friends. I'd be like, hey, check this out. I want your opinion on this. And then they'd be like, eh. Or they'd be like, hey, tell me about this band. What are they doing? You know, and, and when they start drilling with you with questions as a producer, you know you got something. So, if your band is sick and you work with a good producer and like you've built something that's undeniable, the producer will pitch you. No guarantee, but most of them will. Okay. So that's something to consider. So I'm going to wrap this up. I mean, this has been pretty long witted. Thank you for staying with me. I will say, please like, and subscribe and leave a comment. If you've enjoyed this, uh, don't beat me up too bad on, uh, stuff. Like I said, the goal here is to teach people how to get signed. Okay. If that's not your goal. That stuff's not for you. You can disregard all that information. Try to apply it to your situation though. I feel like there's something for everybody here to learn. If you want to get your stuff mixed and you want it to sound good and you want to be competitive, you can hire me and get you a badass sounding mix. You can head over to mixbyjoel.com and I'll mix your song for you. But if you want to learn how to mix your own music so your demos don't suck, so you can pitch them to a writer or producer or whatever, I recommend nailthemix.com, the best place to learn how to mix music on the entire internet. And uh, P.S. I just want to say maybe I'll do one of these on marketing your music if enough people like this. I've never done the long form content like this on YouTube. So let's see how many people actually stick around and watch something like this and find this valuable. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your time.